Thank you. you stay like that. <laughs> Well, thanks very much for the introductions. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome for Women Inspired by Women panel. Um, the introductions have been made, so not much, much to say, but we have three wonderful panelists, successful women in their careers, and they will tell us more about, about uh, what they do and, and how they have managed to become so successful. So we'd like to start with Katrina. Tell us about the origins, uh, your vision, and the origins of Code Op. Uh, what the main challenge that you managed to, or yet did you uh, uh, achieve or uh, tried to solve with CodeOp? Cool. So CodeOp is an international tech school for women, trans, and non-binary people. Um, most people at this point have heard about coding schools um, or technical boot camps. They've been around for over a decade and have been a really efficient model for churning out technical talent. Um, and that's a good thing for the tech industry, which needs technical talent. What the tech industry needs more, however, is diverse technical talent, and that is more difficult to find. The funny thing about code schools, and I mean about 99% of them, are founded by men, appeal to men, and actually replicate the gender disparity that we already see in tech. So if you're looking at the student demographics of most code schools, you'll see that about 30% are women. Um, and as we know, uh, across the world, um, roughly 30% of the tech labor force is made up of women. So on the one hand, we have a really impactful educational model for churning out technical talent, um, and we also have this chronic problem worldwide with the gender disparity in tech. And so in 2018, what we set out to do was to create a tech school, but solely for women to address the gender disparity in tech. This was the idea. Um, something interesting was that, um, you know, coding boot camps, as I mentioned, they're around the world. Only a small percent are actually uh, focused on women. So you have one in the San Francisco Bay Area, you have one in Madrid, you have one in New York, despite the fact that this gender disparity is, is worldwide, right? Um, and so when we launched CodeOp, um, we thought it was, you know, Nothing crazy to think we need an international code school really tackling this problem. So that's what we set out to do. Why are there not, I mean, less than 1% of all the code schools are focused on women. Why is that the case? In my opinion, uh, to create a startup, no, to, to create this vision, um, often you need capital to do that. To scale the vision, to internationalize, you also need capital to do that. We know that last year, less than 3% of venture capital went to women-founded companies. No? CodeOp is operating in Barcelona. We're operating in Malaysia. We have a campus in London, and in August, we're running our programs in Brazil. We closed two fundraising rounds. I'm quite certain that this vision that we had would not have been possible if we didn't have investors backing us. So that was one of the hurdles that we faced in really manifesting this vision. That was from the entrepreneurial side, just fighting to exist. On the other end, what we're trying to do is to encourage women to pursue tech. So for decades, women have not been encouraged to pursue tech. Um, that means part of the work that we're doing, the unpaid work that we're doing, is a lot of community development, letting women know around the world that this is a viable career path and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to get into tech. Um, so these are a couple of the, the barriers that we face and, and how we've overcome it. Oh, thank you very much for that. Very interesting. Actually, we have time. I'll ask you some more about that 3% that is uh, really something to change. Um, Tehran, uh, going back to you, I, like Impulse for Women is doing um, an admirable job supporting women entrepreneurs. We'd also <coughs> like to hear about your origins, your creation, the, 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 how it all started and, and how it has been evolving. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm coming from the venture cap private banking, then I moved to the venture capital in 2016. And in 2017, they suggested me if I wanted to become general partner of the second fund. And I was like, oh, okay. And it was after seeing some pitchings, uh, some pitchings from some startups that I went with my friends, females, investors. I told them, and it was like, and there's only four females in the whole Spain with this position. And was like, what? No, 
that cannot be possible. What is going on? Where are the startups? What, why the females are interacting with investors differently? So it was like a bunch of questions without any answer at all. So we decided to build up a nonprofit organization called Impulse for Women with the main goal to connect female lead tech and uh, startups and also social impact projects uh, founded or co-founded from males or females in order that they were covering the CDG goals. That was 2017. Uh, we decided to build up a matchmaking platform, like a professional Tinder, uh, and we started in Spain. When we were making this scouting, we didn't arrive to more than 150 between female lead tech entrepreneurs and uh, social impact projects. Probably there were more, but I didn't reach them. So I decided to move forward to Europe, and then my first step was supposed to go to North America because the Pendle Capital that I'm working at, they are investing in North America, Europe since 2008. So the deal flow and also the investors, it was easy for me to bring them both to the platform. But in the meantime, they started to arrive females from Lebanon, South Africa, uh, Russia, and it was like, wow, what I'm going to do? I do not know any investor in Russia or Lebanon. So we decided to start to close agreements with uh, public and private international institutions. And that's the way that we started to grow. They didn't have any female lead tech startups, and they, it was difficult for them. So we were in the middle making also these connections. And today, what we're doing also is not only with the uh, public-private organizations, we're also connecting the startups with the investors and also with corporates that they want to make a digital transformation. Today, we are 11,000 startups worldwide. Um, uh, we do have a board of 75 people. All of them, they're, dif they're in different uh, Ex, uh, units of expertise. We divide them the business angels, venture capital, corporate venture capital, social impact funds in different boards of build up of male and female and from different countries. And that was also the proof uh, that we could give to the market that what we were doing was coming from the investment side and it was a guarantee behind. So it's for free for startups as we are an NGO, well, NPO. And the fact is that we started to have a lot of startups from Africa, and we wanted to give the opportunity to any female lead tech startup social impact project to be s seen from an investor. Uh, our goal for this year is to arrive to 1,400 investors, and uh, hope we could still grow in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, very impressive numbers, actually. Um, moving now to, to um, Pilar, um, fr probably from your experience on creating Boncel, you have experienced uh, in your blood uh, many of those challenges. Tell us a little bit about uh, your experience. Sure. Well, in my case, I didn't plan it this way, but apparently it worked. It worked well. Um, so let me very briefly uh, tell you uh, my story. So um, I used to be a really stressed M&A lawyer. I used to work in Sao Paulo in Brazil, actually. And what I detected is that Nobody really liked to work with documents doing copy paste, right? It's just a waste of time. So it was an idea uh, that I, you know, suffer directly. When I came back to Spain, to Valencia, my hometown, after living abroad for more than 12 years and did my and after doing my LLM at Columbia Law School, I, I met Marcos, who is my co-founder and happens to be my husband today. And and we decided to launch uh, Bounce. Um, we incorporated the company in January 2019, and I think it was three weeks later that I discovered that I was pregnant of my first baby, my first baby boy. Right now, he's two years and a half, uh, doing great. And well, apparently it did well because, you know, we were still developing the product. Uh, it was about to launch, you know, the very first, you know, MVP of, of Bouncel, which is, you know, an all-in-one contract management platform powered by AI. And then I got pregnant again. <laughs> so I got my second baby boy, who right now is uh, nine months old. And during this journey, 
obviously it has been difficult. Uh, super rewarding. Uh, so please, if anyone you know is about to start you know founding uh, her startup, uh, come talk to me <laughs> uh, later on. Um, I super encourage anyone to do it. Uh, but obviously, um, it takes uh, courage. It's hard. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. It's super easy. Uh, no, <laughs> you need support. You need you know a strong you know network. Uh, um, because sometimes you feel down and and you need someone you know to to, to be at your at your side thanks a lot actually um, that network is uh, is very important for me actually personally i've ha been lucky enough as to have uh, important me mentors around or like uh, and, uh, mentors around my career and good and good network of, of support uh, and actually i guess that that co help uh, other than the education it's also a very relevant part of the of the program, no? So tell us. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's pretty uncanny the parallels between my experience, becoming an entrepreneur, launching a startup, and that journey so with our students, no, who um, are are taking a leap of faith to transition into tech, often, you know, at the age of thirty and not knowing it's possible, right? So I, on the one hand, I, I had never met any women founders. Um, I don't come from an MBA background, and so I had, no, I had no idea what it meant to launch a startup, right? And the first thing I did was find a community of women entrepreneurs, and they were really fundamental in supporting me in those initial steps, um, because all of a sudden this world opened up and I had these stories uh, of, of women doing it. So, um, this became very encouraging. When I launched Code Up, I knew that it would be a similar situation, right? And so um, the community aspect of Code Up is, is critical uh, because, again, we're having to undo yours, years of uh, stereotypes, um, thoughts that have been deeply ingrained into the consciousness that, you know, I, I can't do this, it's too hard for me, um, I'm too old to do it, I have a kid, I have to, you know, I can't do both things. And so when we build the community, um, we're sharing stories of people that have done it. And that becomes a really important initial step, which is the top of the funnel of our impact strategy, right? So that community needs to happen usually at, at the top from the beginning. Then throughout the journey, um, the reality is, is that, you know, despite code op being solely for, for women, um, once they get into tech, they're going to be in a male-dominated field, right? That's not going to be, code op environment is not necessarily going to be the environment they have once they get into tech. It was the same case for me when I was a data scientist, and it was the same case for me when I became a founder. Um, and so you need that, you, you know, it takes a village to support you and carry you through, through these times, um, because things are going to come up. And, and the support of a community is going to make you that much stronger. And so um, we're tackling it at, from the front, and we're tackling it at the back. Um, there's so many networks of incredible women doing things. Um, and so it's just really connecting the dots and, and bringing everyone together to, to make it happen. No, definitely, definitely it's crucial. Um, from your experience, Theran, um, both on networking or, or on the mentoring side, which are the critical elements that makes the difference for entrepreneurs? Well, actually, as we started as a networking mm. platform, but uh, due to COVID, uh, we started when I was spending before that we got uh, 75 people uh, supporting Impulse for Women, they were investors, and when the COVID came over, we saw that a lot of startups, they were struggling. So I turn over, look at my board and say, hey, will you give some time and experience to all these females? Because to be a mentor is not so easy. You need a kind of expertise and you have to be very, very careful of what you're saying. So the only way that I would be, I was able to give quality was asking to investors. So we started with the first mentoring session online. It was in, uh, April. I, I used it actually, yeah, amazing <laughs> yeah. experience. <laughs> 2020, then we would did another one with you and woman. And there it was two females that they were invested, but it was random for sure. The, the main purpose was not, was not to connect the startups with investors, it was that it happened. And the third time it was with the government of, of Finland. And uh, besides this, in the meantime, we started to include pitching sessions and we were supporting to European Business Angels Networking to give them 
we gave them some female lead tech entrepreneurs. So it was like, why I'm going to give it to them if I could do it myself? <laughs> I know the investors and I know the startups. So we also included webinars last year with our advisory board. We started covering all the lifetime average of the startups because uh, we started with how to make an agreement partner and how to go to, we got someone in our board from NASDAQ and he was explaining how to, the steps that you need to, uh, to make in order to take your startup to NASDAQ to prepare it to the stock market. And also we started to do podcasts, but the interview was other startups because they are explaining their own experience and it's a part of education that I love it because it doesn't matter if you're a female or male. The difference is that the females, they're saying the good things and the bad things. <laughs> Males normally say only the good things. The good things. Yeah, so that's a, good, that's a good point for them as well to see, hey, they are suffering the same ways. That's why your clarification is good or bad. I mean, it's not just to pick up into the gender. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then from your experience, uh, Pilar, uh, I, I imagine you have found successful and, and very helpful mentors and, and a good network on your experience. Tell us about. Yes, absolutely. And well, I recently I have just finished this um, ultimate program of uh, Google for Startups, uh, Founders Academy, uh, Women Founders Academy, and it has been really, really helpful because what happens is that, you know, being a CEO, it's, it's hard. Obviously, being a, a woman CEO, I truly believe that it's even harder. Um, there are a lot of things that we need to work. Um, it's not particularly my case because uh, I've never been, you know, that, but a lot of women tend to lack confidence, which is something really important if you want to pitch, if you want to sell, if you want to do business, right? Uh, you need to believe in you, you need to uh, inspire confidence, and this is, for me, the base. Being part of a community, uh, for me, is like, a, it's like home. You know that when you, are home, when you are at home, you feel safe, you know that you are always going to find people that are going to support you, everyone, you know. Uh, we all have the same problems, and for example, in in my recent case, uh, I have connected with a lot of you know female founders uh, from here, from from Europe, and we are all you know at the same stage, you know during you know in the in, in our startups, and it's really you know helpful because for example, uh, people want to do business with people that get along with. Right. So if you get along with someone, then he's going to make you an intro. He's going to recommend you. Uh, I remember, for example, uh, more than 10 years ago when I did my LLM at Columbia, I am right now, you know, after nine years, receiving qualified leads from my colleagues from the university, from college. Right. So uh, it's very important to, you know, build relationships, uh, nurture the relationships and, and just have fun during this journey. <laughs> Perfect. We've um, we've talked uh, more on the on the what the entrepreneur, what the professional can do. Um, I'd like to go back to the three percent we mentioned before and uh, and have your thoughts on what the market will do different. Uh, what uh, actually recently read, read a, a NGBS um, report from it was based on a study in the four, in the four, 2014 more or less, but where it claims there is a natural bias on panels asking questions to entrepreneurs, either if they are male or women, the type of questions may be different and there is a natural bias on perceiving the projects in a different manner. Do you really think there is that bias and uh, what is your view around that and what will, what the market on the organizations could do to change it? I really do think that they are buyers. Actually, as a venture capital, I can tell you a female is coming with a cash flow like it's almost real. Actually, sometimes you have to tell her, hey, put 10,000, 15,000 higher because maybe you're not going <laughs> to, it could come anything others types of ways that you were not thinking about it, but it could be. And for the males, you have to take like 25% off and review it. Like when a female wants to go to see an investor, she needs to have everything super controlled and I need all the team, everything. And a man can come with a hot potato. Yes, and an idea and they drop it and they, they, they sell it. And that's funny, I mean, Female teams are much more successful than only male teams, but when they cross each other, 
It's amazing. Mail is going to go to firm raise of a 5% year one for 100,000 euros. Next year, he's going to go for 5% for 150,000 euros. Next year, he's going to make 200,000 for a 5% of the company. A female will give a 300%. Uh, <laughs> 30% for 150 for the next three years because I do not like to go to see investors. So when you got the, the, the way that we approach to the risk, male or female is so different but that when they're together, she's uh, making con a conservative way and he's going to the risk. So they are getting to a good average. And really, we do have different mindset. Doesn't matter if you're from Norway or South Africa, I could tell you. Now I see it. I got global startups. I could see the way females are reacting. We are the same. We, we have it in, in our DNA. So, yeah, DNA. Sometimes I say NDA. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably have it in both. That's my experience. I could still uh, tell you more tips because it's funny to, to see the difference between us, mm, females and males. From my perspective, I mean, it, it's certainly true that we need more representation on, on leadership teams, um, 100%. What's also true is we all have biases. You no, know, we all have blinders on, and we need to check them. And that helps when you have people who are different than you, or, that are around you. In my case, actually, when I launched CodeOp, my assumption was that women investors would understand our project and therefore be more inclined to invest in CodeOp. What happened was that, in fact, probably 90% of our investors are men in their 40s and 50s who have daughters. They were the ones who understood our project. And so that was, that was, you know, that was a big surprise for me. Um, and so um, for me, it's just a matter of ch always checking your assumptions. And you can do that more easily when you have different people around you and then on the leadership team, making sure that there is representation. Do you have any thoughts, Pilar? Well, in my case, um, I can say that, for example, when I talk to investors, they would say, hey, Pilar, I love your energy. I, I, I like a lot your storytelling. Um, I really, you know, buy your, your passion, your ambition. And this is something that it may be the exception, right? Because a lot of women tend to be not that ambitious, not that, you know, they tend to think smaller than men. Um, uh, we still have 100% of, of bouncel of the capital. Uh, when we incorporate the company, I design. Maybe it's because I'm a I'm a lawyer. I don't know. But we design this financial, you know, planning, and we receive a lot of public financing. Um, but you know, I have been you know talking to investors for three years, uh, building that relationship, which again is super important. And in the next months, maybe it's about to you know close the deals. Important is you need to, to, to be. I mean, you cannot go to an investor, he's a human being, like, hey, I want to talk to you because I need money. No, <laughs> CS super, uh, tell me your project, but give me some time. I need to know you. And also, because as a venture capital now, from our portfolio, the startups, the, the main reason why they're breaking up the startups is because the team, <laughs> it's not the business model. So mm, we were discussing the other day with a friend, like 90%, 99 no, because COVID could happen as well. <laughs> so this is a very big, important point that you should uh, take advice. No, definitely. I, I subscribe 100% of what you're saying. Actually, on my experience as, uh, as an associate at Women in, and We A for STEAM, we, we aim to um, support uh, or at least evaluate the potential uh, investments as, a, as an association uh, without those bias and we're taking kind of a fair view on women-led uh, entrepreneurs because there is, uh, I think the bias is on every, in, in each one of us. It's like it's on us ourselves that we undermine or we basically play smaller than we should and potentially also on the other side being men or women, uh, the type of questions that might be asked or the type of assessments or projections definitely could be different. But definitely we should change that. I think the 3% is in the US, in the Europe is uh, around 7% last time I checked, uh, but it's definitely lower than 10% of the investments uh, go to, to startup-led uh, female startups uh, let um, female let the startups look whatever um, 
I would like to use the last uh, minutes we have to, we have a wonderful presence of uh, audience of um, mainly women, but I see quite a fair good representation of men. So good that they are also interested on those topics because definitely they are also agents in the change. Uh, but we'd like to have uh, our final round of advice for all those uh, women trying to make a change in the market, in tech, in STEAM, entrepreneurs, or even just uh, in, in, in endeavoring a new challenge uh, on an industry. I go? Oh. Okay. <laughs> sure. Let's go backwards. Just go for it. Dream big. Um, don't overthink. Just do it. <laughs> it will, you know, work well. And please do not procrastinate, you know, being a mom <laughs> for work, because I think that you will regret. Um, I, I will say the same thing that I say to our prospective students, and that is, if there's been a voice in your head uh, that's been flirting with the idea of launching a venture or getting into tech, and that little voice keeps on coming back, um, it's highly likely you need to honor that voice and just go for it. Again, stop thinking about it and go for it. Um, that's the first point. The second point I want to say is that um, when I raised my first round, um, I had just immigrated to Barcelona from the San Francisco Bay Area. I was not in the startup scene at all. Most of my investors are second and third connections, which meant that I had to start talking to people and building relationships. So certainly put yourself out there, start talking to people. There's a whole world waiting for you that I discovered four years ago, and it's really exciting, and, um, and it's waiting for you. Well, like you, you need like 40% of your time to, to fundraise. So it means that you're not focused on your project and you cannot be the whole day doing or developing your product or service. So the due diligence with investors is super important. Uh, if you are, you need, you have your MVP, you're not invoicing, don't go to a venture capital, never. But relationships, if you meet them, start a, really, a personal relationship ask them their opinion, what do you think, which is my pre-money valuation, what, uh, do you think that you could connect me with a business angel? This time of relations, it takes at least six months to, to keep it. And maybe I need a business angel now, but in one year and a half, I will need a Series A, like happened to her. So to meet all these people and know them, and all, in one way to the investors, you give the chance to, to, to observe you. And in the other side, it gives you support for you in order to develop. Thanks a lot for being here. It has been really a pleasure meeting you all and, and chatting with you. And I hope uh, you all enjoyed the discussion. Thank you. Thank you.